we're going to focus on the recent announcement, today's announcement on Wagner Group, but just really briefly, can you clarify U.S. position on this debate on tanks for Ukraine that's going on in the donor conference in Germany? Does the U.S. want Germany to send Leopard tanks and allow the transfer of Leopard tanks um, from other countries? Would the U.S. send Abrams tanks if that's the only way to get Germany to send their Leopard tanks? We believe that it's important that uh, every nation that can support Ukraine and their defense needs. And right now, President Zelensky has talked about this, uh, one of the critical needs uh, for the Ukrainian armed forces this winter and probably into the spring uh, is going to be armor, armor capability, uh, because of the kinds of fighting they're doing in the Donbass. That can include tanks. It doesn't have to, but it certainly can include tanks. And the Ukrainians do have a real need for additional tanks. Uh, they've been using largely T-72s, which are old Soviet-made tanks, and, and, you know, it's been almost a year. So we certainly welcome the uh, contributions uh, of other nations, uh, including uh, the UK, which just in the last week or so agreed to send Challenger tanks. Uh, and we know that Germany is working through their own process here with respect to the Leopards. The Leopards are great tanks, very capable, uh, won't require an exorbitant amount of training for the Ukrainians, should Germany want to move in that direction. But that's the key, Patsy. It's Germany's decision to make. We are not out there arm twisting and pushing and cajoling. Uh, we want countries to give what they can, um, contribute what they can, when and where they can, uh, and on the size and scale and scope that they're comfortable with. And that's for Germany to decide. I will add, though, that Germany has uh, increased their contributions. They were already, even early on in the war, one of the world's leading financial contributors to Ukraine uh, in terms of just financial aid and assistance. Um, and they have over certainly the last several months really evolved their own willingness and ability to provide advanced capabilities. Uh, and that's been deeply appreciated by everybody. But is this standoff or a debate on tanks, is that an example of a threat to NATO unity that President Biden spoke about in December? The alliance remains very, very solidly behind Ukraine. Uh, uh, first of all, I would not describe this as a standoff. I mean, these are ongoing iterative discussions that we have with all our allies and partners about what they can provide and at what scale. And again, these are sovereign nations. They get to decide because they, don't, they have their own national security needs they have to consider as well, just like we do. Um, but in, in just stepping broadly back, the, the alliance has been just incredibly uh, uh, solidly behind and, and supportive of Ukraine. And we don't see we don't see that fracturing at all. OK, let's move on to today's announcement on the Wagner Group. Uh, the U.S. is designating it as the transnational criminal organization. As I understand, that primarily means freezing Wagner assets in the U.S. and also prohibiting Americans from providing support. How significant is this move, John? I mean, what kind of size assets are we talking about? It will give us more flexibility. I mean, um, we, we were already, of course, uh, uh, deeply sanctioning uh, Russia writ large across the board. And some of those sanctions and export controls we know um, also tangentially had an effect on, on private military contractors like Wagner. But this is really targeted towards Wagner specifically. Um, and, and I'll let Treasury talk to this in more detail. They'll have more to put out on this next week. But you're right about what that designation does. It, um, it blocks and prevents the transfer of, of monies uh, to Wagner from, from any U.S. entity, U.S. Uh, country. And it might lead to additional measures by other countries now that we're doing this. So we'll see where that goes. Can you talk about the additional sanctions? Was it going to, going to be specifically to Wagner as well that you the, said? What, what we announced today was this transnational criminal organization designation for Wagner, which will open up additional ways to, to freeze uh, any contributions to Wagner's efforts uh, and, and, and further help cut off the flow of finances to them as a, uh, as a group. And how immediate will the impact be? And will it be also impacting Wagner operations, not just in Ukraine, well, once, but also other the, countries? Once the designation's in place, it, you know, it's in place, and, and we're executing it. Um, so there'll be an immediate effect. Um, and again, we, we encourage other nations as well to, um, uh, to, uh, to help us in cracking down on Wagner's uh, ability to literally commit atrocities around the world. And, that's the, and I think that's kind of what your second part of your question is. This isn't just about uh, it's, not the, the, it's not about just cutting off their ability to, 
commit atrocities in Ukraine. It's about their ability to commit atrocities around the world. Right. So why is the U.S. designating Wagner Group as a transnational criminal organization and not as a foreign terrorist organization? I, I think we believe that this move right now is the appropriate move uh, and uh, it will have an impact on Wagner. Is the goal then FTO next? I'm not going to get ahead of where we are, Patsy. But right now we're deciding that we're going to designate them as a TCO and, uh, and we're going to continue to try to uh, further squeeze their ability uh, to operate uh, and to, to fund themselves, and, uh, and I'm not going to get ahead of where, where, okay. where that is. The other thing that you underscored uh, score today was the sharing of information about the transfer of weapons from North Korea to the Wagner Group that you will share with the uh, Security Council's North Korea sanctions. We, we shared it today. You did share it today. So what is the goal here specifically for North Korea? We believe it's two things. Uh, the, the most important thing is uh, to try to stop this flow of support from North Korea to Russia. Uh, and that's why what I also said was we urge them to stop this immediately. That they are violating existing UN Security Council resolutions. And the reason we brought it up today is because we want to see if there's additional uh, uh, sanctioning freedom of uh, 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 flexibility here. We don't know. That's one reason why we brought it up to the Committee of Experts. Um, uh, but we certainly want it to stop. The second component here, and this isn't, com this isn't unimportant either, is the North Koreans have been just baldly lying uh, about their support to Russia. They've just said they're not doing it. They've claimed they have nothing to do with it. And today we felt it was important in keeping in conjunction with our conversations at the UN to lay out demonstrable evidence that in fact they are supporting uh, Russia with, uh, with arms and ammunition and we got the goods on them. And we and we put it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the Wagner Group in Ukraine, um, you said that they are using 40,000 Russian convicts to fight in Ukraine. Experts who study the group say that the casualty levels are quite massive. 80 to 80, uh, 90 percent die in battle during their standard contract. Is this something that you can confirm? How are the how is the Wagner Group using these convicts? And we, we can confirm that they certainly are uh, the, the the bulk of their manpower, at least. In, in the Donbass uh, are, are convicts. Um, I said today that some 50,000 uh, Wagner employees are in Ukraine and 40,000, the vast majority, we believe, are convicts. I mean, they're going into the jails and they're opening up the cells and they're just pulling people out. Do we know right what the casualty fight. levels? The casualty rates, uh, we believe, for uh, the convicts is extraordinarily high. As a matter of fact, what we think is that 90% of their casualties are convicts themselves. They're just throwing them into the fight, Patsy. No training, uh, no organizational uh, capability, no command and control. They're just throwing them into this meat grinder in the, ba in, in the Bakhmut and Solodar areas, um, and they're paying a heavy price for it. But do we have an understanding of the exact number of how many Russian convicts have died in battle? I'm afraid I wouldn't have that exact number for you. Um, at this point, does the U.S. believe that Vladimir Putin should be prosecuted for his use of Russian convicts in Ukraine? We believe that Russia needs to be held properly account, to account for the atrocities and war crimes that we know Russian soldiers and Wagner uh, contract employees are conducting inside Ukraine, which is why we're helping the international community document that. We're going to help provide uh, whatever support to international uh, uh, investigative efforts uh, are ongoing uh, and make sure that, uh, that, that the Russian armed forces, uh, and in this case Wagner as well, can be properly held to account. And specifically on the use of Russian convicts, uh, does the U.S. believe that this is a violation of human rights, a violation of I'll leave that to the I'll leave that to the international lawyers to, to determine. Without a doubt, uh, Wagner employees and Russian soldiers are committing atrocities and war crimes in, in Ukraine, and that's as plain as the nose on your face. You can see what they're doing. Um, we just want to make sure it's properly documented so proper accountability measures can be held. Can you speak more about this tension between Prigozhin and the uh, Russian leadership? What does it tell you about cohesion in the Russian top leadership at this point? Well, as I said today uh, in the briefing room, uh, we know that the tensions between Prigozhin individually, but Wagner institutionally, and the Ministry of Defense are increasing. 
uh, because Mr. Progrosian wants to take credit for all the work he's doing in the Donbass region and the way he's, uh, uh, the progress that he's making in, t in towns like Bakhmut uh, and Solodar. Um, and that is, it is causing tensions. In addition to that, uh, he has been a, a very open critic of Russian generals and the way that the U Russian military has been prosecuting the war, not just in the Donbass, but elsewhere as well. I mean, he's been very open. And it appears to us uh, that he's trying to raise his profile uh, with Mr. Putin and make himself seem more relevant and more viable than even the Russian military. Uh, when in fact, uh, what he's also doing is trying to fill his own coffers. Uh, and, uh, and, and it appears that he also has economic uh, gains uh, here at play for what he's trying to do there. Is the tension between Prigozhin and the Russian leadership something that the U.S. can take advantage of? We think that, well, one of the things, obviously we, we put it out there publicly, uh, we think it's important for uh, the world to know uh, what we're seeing in respect to these uh, tensions. Um, we think what should be taken advantage of is the opportunity for Putin to end this war. Uh, he could do it today. He could pull the Wagner group out. He could pull all his troops out. That's the opportunity that needs to be taken advantage of. But we do think it's important uh, to showcase for the world the utter brutality with which Mr. Putin is willing to keep fighting this war, this unprovoked war against the Ukrainian people. And now, in addition to everything else, Patsy, the, the cruise missiles, the drones hitting apartment buildings in the last you know, couple of days, He's taken people out of jail with, you know, Prokosian's not doing this without, you know, support, right? Uh, so he's allowing Mr. Prokosian to just empty out the jails and throw convicts uh, into the fight. No training, uh, you know, no skills, uh, no leadership uh, to do nothing more than just kill Ukrainian soldiers and innocent Ukrainian civilians. And we believe it's important for that to be out there publicly so that everybody can see exactly uh, the depravity with which uh, he and his forces are running this war. Is there anything else you can share about uh, the Wagner Group? For example, is the flow of convicts, um, you know, lessening, as we have heard in some reports right now, the flow of convicts to fight in Ukraine? Is there any indication that Wagner Group is getting uh, fighters from Syria and other places, for example, former ISIS fighters? Anything else you can share on the Wagner We know that Mr. Prigozhin has tried to recruit for Ukraine in places like Syria. I couldn't give you the exact numbers of, of, of how many he got or whether they're still in the fight, but it is uh, certainly uh, one of his plays uh, to go ahead and recruit uh, fighters from outside uh, Russia and, and, and other countries. And, and we know that he's, as I said, clearing out, uh, clearing out prisons. Now, how many he's got on any given day, what the throughput is, I don't believe we have you know, that specific. But, in general, as I said today, we know that he has, you know, thrown about 50,000 people into Ukraine. Do you believe they're a formidable force? How effective are they, the Wagner Group? Without question, they have made some incremental progress in uh, Bakhmut and Solodar in, in the Donbass, but at a heavy, heavy price in casualties, as we talked about. Uh, it's a meat grinder. He is throwing, literally throwing ill-equipped, ill-prepared, almost no training individuals into this fight with the Ukrainian armed forces who, while they may not have the same numbers in terms of advantage, have a huge advantage in skill, organizational uh, alignment, command and control, weapon systems provided by so many countries, including the U.S. Um, and, and they're just chewing these prisoners up. Now, that said, because uh, manpower doesn't seem to be a problem for Mr. Prigozhin, uh, they have made some incremental progress. But as we've also said, and we don't want to, you know, the, the, the Ukrainians are still fighting over Bakhmut and Solodar, and so that's not over. We still consider that contested territory. But even if they, the Prigozhin group, end up uh, with Bakhmut and Solodar, there's no guarantee they're going to keep it for very long because the Ukrainians have proven time and time again that even when they lose territory, they'll go back and, re and retake it. Um, and even if that doesn't happen, Patsy, 
Uh, it's not as if those two towns are going to change the strategic direction of the war. They're not going to put the Ukrainians on their back feet to, to a degree uh, that the whole war changes character. These are uh, two mining towns in, in, Don, in the Donbass, and the fact that they're mining towns ought to give you some clue as to why Mr. Prigozhin is so interested in them. John Kirby, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.